Hey, Greg, good to see you. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thanks, David. Good to see you. Where does this podcast find you today? I'm in beautiful Auckland in New Zealand. That's where our head offices are. Ah, oh, wonderful. Wonderful. Is, that's the North Island, right? It is. It's the um, biggest city in New Zealand. It's the North Island, and it's, it's a beautiful city. It's surrounded by uh, water, so we all get out to go out fishing a bunch. And um, it's quite a mild climate, so we don't get too much higher than 26, 27 degrees, usually 23 in the summer. Um, but we never freeze either, so you're quite mild. Oh, lovely. Maybe we can start. You can just tell us a little bit about your background and how you got into the nutraceutical business. Yeah, thanks, David. So I'm a pharmacist by trade and I've been doing that for a little over 30 years now, getting close to 35. Um, and I've always really been interested in, in new technology. So uh, whether it was the internet or robotics or, as it turns out, biotechnology. And that's led me down various different uh, places in my career. But uh, around a decade ago, I got involved um, in biotechnology and started working with a company that was had invented a molecule that targeted mitochondria. And uh, from there, really got deep into um, how mitochondria affect our health, but also um, that led me to how mitochondria affect our, how we age. Um, and then about four years ago, left that company and um, started thinking through uh, you know, really what happens to ourselves as we age. And it's not just about your mitochondria, it's actually about a whole bunch of things that change and pathways that uh, change as we age. And I discovered a paper called The Nine Hallmarks of Aging, which is really a story or a paper around what's actually causing aging and driving aging in our cells. And as a pharmacist, I also looked at it and went, actually, these are not just nine drivers of aging. These are nine targets that we can seek to modulate as we age. And that's really where I got into the nutraceuticals because I could see that pharmaceutical companies we're targeting these pathways, um, but these results of that work may not turn up for a decade. Yet we understand those pathways really well, and we also understand what nutraceuticals or ingredients interact with those pathways. Uh, and though, so I set about formulating products that um, use natural ingredients to that affect the pathways of aging. What's the process there? You're looking for a pathway of aging that you can possibly intersect with, and then how do you get from that? to the actual product? Yeah, so it's, it's really interesting because a lot of the uh, ingredients or natural products that we all know and love and are quite popular because they have really beneficial effects, it turns out they have impact on many of the pathways associated with aging. So a really good example of that is, is a, a curcumin, which uh, has been used forever. It's been used majority of the time for uh, inflammation and pain relief and so on. Uh, it turns out curcumin is, uh, really, has a really interesting impact on our DNA and DNA repair mechanisms. Mm. And DNA is actually the primary DNA decline of function is actually a primary driver of aging. And I could list off a whole bunch of ingredients that um, affect different pathways. Uh, astaxanthin, which is an antioxidant involved in um, uh, supporting membrane health, has a really significant impact on mitochondria. And mitochondria dysfunction is, is another a key pathway associated with aging. So it was the process really is to look at those pathways, um, uh, have a look at what, uh, do a literature research to understand which of the compounds have impact on those pathways, and then start to stitch together something which supports the different hallmarks of aging or different pathways that decline as we age, so like uh, so DNA, for example, is something that you want to look after from your 20s, and, but you don't need something to help with zombie cells or cellular senescence until your 50s. So, um, so really what we, we put together was formulations which kind of target the issues associated with aging so that you can take them at different periods of your life and because you, you don't need fisetin, for example, in your 20s, but it's a very useful molecule in your 50s. Mm -hmm. And you're partnering with scientists um, out there. How do you identify the scientists? Are they the, the folks who are the authors of these papers or how do you source them? Yeah, we, we, we definitely had a look at who are the thought leaders in the field around specific areas of, um, of the research that we were looking into. And 
we, we work with them uh, and support their research, uh, but also, um, you know, these guys have spent 10, 20, 30 years in the lab unpacking how these ingredients work and what their functions are. And uh, really, we lean into that research and stand on the shoulders of giants, essentially. These, uh, these are very, very clever people who have been doing really interesting work. And they've been toiling away uh, before the hallmarks were even known, if you will. They've been toiling away, see, unpacking how these ingredients work. And it's just really this nice timing thing where uh, the world is waking up to the fact that we can modulate the aging process. And it turns out these, these people have been working on these molecules for up, sometimes up to, to decades. And are you working in collaboration with them as far as the actual ingredients, the quantity, you know, the dosage? Like, I don't know anything about this, so it seems incredibly complicated to me. Yeah, look, it is complicated. And uh, yes, we do work with them to look at what are the optimal doses, um, and also optimal combinations as well, because aging is super complex and it's not just one pathway. You can't just take an aspirin, for example, and it sort of fixes, uh, fixes different um, uh, pathways. So we, we look at how do we stitch together these formulations so that they are targeting each of the, um, the pathways and sometimes in multiple different ways as well, so that we're getting, I guess, a 360 degree look at. Um, how do we you know, modulate this this really interesting aging process? And uh, the, the the knowledge that uh, these folk bring is just absolutely phenomenal. So it, 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 it I guess accelerates what we can achieve um, in a, in a really short amount of time. How do you, the the sourcing of the ingredients? So you know one of the things around this whole sector is is it bird feathers or is it you know how do you do the quality control? How do you find these things? Yeah, look, that's really, really challenging and such a good question because you can have different versions of the same ingredient and some will get absorbed and some will not. Some will be um, not particularly, uh, I guess, dense in the ingredient that you're looking for. So we've actually had to go and out to, re uh, out to the suppliers and say, look, this is the specification of what we're after and get bespoke versions of what we're looking for and uh, and then also look at it from a perspective of are we getting the absorption of the actual ingredients so it's got beneficial effects so um, it's a, a work in progress we are always refining what we've got um, so that we improve the effect um, but a, a great example is that we actually we went to india to look for the fisetin ingredient um, and speak to the uh, the uh, the, the supplier to make sure of course that it's sustainable, um, but also um, at a, a concentration that makes it useful and actually have an effect. And then is there a looping back to the scientist with the, so you say, okay, we've, we think we've sourced these ingredients, please test these in whatever manner you do. Yeah, so the, the scientists we work with have labs that, that they run. And so, yes, we do that. We've also worked with a company in New Zealand that uh, tests the ingredients just to make sure that um, when we say something is a, a senolytic, for example, that it's actually having a, a, an effect on um, re removing or reducing the level of senescent cells. Um, so, yeah, these are this is yeah, quite important work just to validate, really, that the formulas are working. Um, as a pharmacist, you want to be making sure that um, what we're saying is actually what these products are doing. And so yeah, that, that's been quite important for us. Yeah, absolutely. As, as I said, that's, you know, at least here in America, you, you can sort of say anything about anything and you're out of the guidance of the FDA. Yeah, well, it's, it's, I mean, that's, the, I guess, the difference between perhaps a pharmaceutical company and a, and a you know, supplement company is that uh, there is less rigor around um, those products. So what we've sought to do is, I guess, sort of be the, the intersect of, of that so that uh, we have got, um, you know, obviously we can't make any uh, claims because we're not a pharmaceutical company, but just making sure that we've got the best quality ingredients so that uh, we you know, do, uh, people do get, have evidence of effect just by taking the product. Absolutely. And we discussed a couple of weeks ago about something very interesting, um, this AI initiative. Tell, tell us a little bit about this and what you're planning to do with it. 
Yeah, we're incredibly excited about this initiative. Um, it started with a, comp a, a conversation with the founder of a company called In Silico Medicine. These, uh, this is a world's, uh, I guess, leading longevity company, even I guess by stealth. Um, but what they're doing is that they are applying uh, artificial intelligence for drug discovery, and uh, they're making incredible gains in this area. They're developing new uh, pharmaceuticals at a rate that's almost unheard of and with an efficiency that's almost unheard of. They work with 10 of the top 20 pharmaceutical companies globally to help them uh, develop new drug candidates and uh, and even uh, potentially uh, new targets as well. And I've uh, you know, seen what they've been able to achieve with such a small amount of time. So I had a conversation with the founder, a guy called uh, Dr. Alex Savaronkov, who's the leader in artificial intelligence in the drug discovery area. And I said to him, you know, have, what about pointing your uh, resource and machines towards nutraceutical discovery so that we can develop next generation supplements that uh, have, uh, I guess, uh, even bigger effect than what we've got with our first generation products. So we've just embarked on an exclusive uh, partnership with Insilico Medicine to start to look at, uh, again, the hallmarks of aging and the pathways associated with it, to look to identify uh, new molecules and uh, that come from nature that, that target the aging pathway. So this is something which uh, will see us bring next generation products coming to market mid next year. And uh, so far, what I'm seeing is just is mind blowing in terms of what they've been able to achieve in such a short amount of time. So walk me through how that process is different than the, the current process is reviewing scientific literature, speaking to the scientists and going down that way. How does it work with machine learning? What's the process on that? Yeah, so it's not too dissimilar, I guess, to how we started, which was the process of looking at the pathways associated with aging and then looking at uh, identifying molecules that can um, modulate those pathways. So they're just doing it with 100,000 brains or a million brains rather than one and uh, or, you know, or a handful. So that's, that's just going to accelerate our opportunity to identify molecules that have... Um, perhaps wider impact on those pathways associated with aging. And then in silico medicine have a lab based in China, which is a, a high throughput lab. It's, it's, there's no, not many humans involved in this lab. It's a, it's a robotic lab, which runs 24 seven. And their ability to identify these molecules and then test them for effect, and then also test the combinations and the different ratios means that we can you know perhaps compress five years worth of research into three months so this is uh, really going to accelerate and uh, the our ability to identify a step change maybe you know in, in in efficacy of our formula you mentioned the testing so the machine learning is identifying novel molecules found in nature and combinations thereof how is the testing for efficacy done there yeah, so there's it's just uh, I guess uh, huge. They cell models, um, David. So they they're essentially uh, a whole bunch of um, like you know, hundreds of thousands of, of of wells full of cells, um, and they, they test the combinations, and then they have assays that test the result of those. Um, so we can see what its impact is, perhaps on cellular senescence, for example, and what the efficacy of those molecules are, or the effect on mitochondrial function, or the effect on um, the uh, DNA uh, repair processes. So we're going to be able to test all of these um, molecules, um, even down to their effect potentially on uh, the cell, your cellular clocks that we have on our DNA and uh, and how we perhaps can uh, measure the slow the slowing of aging in, in these particular models. So, and then from there we will start to look at um, the lead candidates and lead candidate combinations. And from there we, we'll go back to the researchers that we work with in the, in the labs who have mouse models to start to look at what the impact is on aging in, in those animals. And of course, because we share so much um, biology with 
uh, mammals and mice and, and mice of men, if you will, um, we'll, we'll get some really clear clues on what's working and what's not. Um, and then from there, we'll take it through to human trials. You mentioned something very interesting there about the clock. Are you seeing development of some products out there where that's possible? Yeah, we are. And it's, it's early days, but uh, definitely um, we can see an imprint with some of the interventions on slowing the, the age clock. So some of the, you know, the interventions that we know work, like calorie restriction, um, taking things like vitamin D, um, uh, exercise mimetics, these are all having a, an impact. So it, it's, it's really only a matter of time now before we validate the effect um, in human clinical trials. Um, and we'll start to see the first um, validated um, protocols that will, will help slow aging. Wow, that'll be a big day. Yeah, I, I was talking with a gentleman called uh, Professor Eric Verdon. He's the uh, head of the Buck Institute. And uh, his, his view is that three to five years um, will be when we have the first pharmaceutical um, compounds that are validated to slow aging. So this, this is all happening and it's, it's happening uh, within our lifetime. In fact, within the next three to five years, so it's, it's quite an exciting space. I've heard that before from others who are more informed than I am. And I think it's very exciting when I tell other people outside of this world that they, you know, it's that, it's that thing, Greg, when I was younger, I was promised a flying car. I still don't have a flying car. Where's my yeah. flying car? And so everything that's sort of like my brain tends to put everything into flying car territory. Yeah. Yeah. Look, it's, it's really interesting. And, and when people, uh, sort of say that to me because it's a really common reaction. I, 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 I say, look, we've actually been doing longevity for the last 200 years. Like we're doing it, we're doing it really well. Like for, you know, pre 200 years ago, um, you know, the average life expectancy was anything from 25 to 35. And it's been like that for all of human history. So when you, when you consider the breakthroughs that we've made that we just all take for granted now, like antibiotics, like hygiene, like, um, uh, surgery, medicine, whatever, um, they've, they've all had a radical impact on our longevity. And, um, and really, if, if you think about um, like 100 years ago, people thought that infections and getting sick was based on bad air and bad luck and low morals and, and the, you know, things like that. And then we discovered bacteria and we, 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 we had a target. We, we started to understand what the enemy was. And through that, we shifted our behavior and we introduced hygiene. So doctors washed their hands between patients and between childbirth. And we uh, washed our hands between um, uh, food and the bathroom. And we, we stopped ch chucking uh, excrement out at the top window onto the street. All these things changed and it had a radical impact on, on, on our longevity. And then we then developed antibiotics. So What's exciting is that we now understand the hallmarks of aging, the, the drivers of aging in our cells. That's driving behavioral changes. We, we all know now that we get out and do some exercise, we're building longevity. We know that if we get good sleep, if we have good diet, if we manage our stress, if we get out and be social, these are like the five behavioral things that we can do that can add a decade to our life. And the next step is, okay, what interventions from a pharmaceutical perspective or a natural perspective can modulate the aging process. And that is ultimately the path that we're going down. And at some point, three to five years, we're going to get our first penicillin, the first longevity gyro protector, if you will. And then we're just going to get better at it because that's what we do as, as humans. We, we figure it out and we refine it. And uh, it's going to add decades um, to our life. And then, of course, we're going to tweak things. And there are animals out there that live for 200 years, the bowhead whale. So they are mammals just like us. So there's no reason that we can't learn from whatever genetic hacks that they've got, which mean that they live longer. And then, of course, the Greenland shark uh, lives for 500 years. So these are animals. We, we can learn from them. And once we do, then... Um, all bets are off as to what uh, what kind of longevity um, we're going to see, and of course, it's not 
longevity that we think of in terms of geriatric longevity. We're going to be talking about bodies that can be aged 30 to 40 um, and have those bodies for 200 years, which is uh, it's a little outside our frame of reference right now, but future humans are going to go, golly, those poor people back then that, uh, that in the early 2000s that uh, only got to live for, for 80 years and only, and only 40 years in good health. I mean, that's, you know, as in adulthood. Um, it's going to be, you know, it's going to be a, as crazy to them as living to 35 or 45 is for us. I want to circle back to the AI. And you mentioned that this current AI, it's, it specializes in identifying molecules for pharmaceutical yeah. use. And I'm wondering about the intersection. So a number of pharmaceuticals, well, I won't say most, a lot of pharmaceuticals have certain negative effects. Is there a way to go in and, and say, okay, like here's existing pharmaceutical, very widely used, but there are these other off-target effects that are happening. Is there a nutraceutical that we can find that can target here so that we can mitigate these the negative aspects? Yeah, 100%, David. I think you're speaking straight into personalized nutrition and personalized medicine. So we are going to get to a stage where we get to have a DNA test before we start taking medicine. And, mm. you know, there may be 10 drugs on the shelf that uh, are appropriate for whatever condition that's being treated, and they'll select the one that's best for you. Um, but also um, they'll be able to look at it and go, okay, look, there's a highly high chance given your genetic makeup that these are going to be a problem. So, yeah, let's uh, supplement with some whatever, uh, insert uh, nutraceuticals here as well. So... Excuse me. Um, so the, there's, there's, the, this will be the future of of uh, of medicine, but I think even more than that, we're going to get to a point where we've got preventative medicine. So that'll be understanding what our genetic makeup is, understanding exactly what's happening with our health challenges right now, um, and and perhaps everything will be graded just like we have you know, cancer from stage zero to stage five. Um, you know, you know, you don't turn up at the doctors um, with a heart condition it's, you know, and it's been brewing for decades. And so we'll start to understand where you are on a perhaps heart disease or liver disease or and, and start perhaps when you get to stage one or stage zero um, and start to actually uh, stage an intervention well before you even get disease. And... Uh, and so, you know, we're, we're in that transition now. Um, I think we're, we're learning um, where ourselves are sit and what trajectory our diseases are on. And, you know, hopefully um, beyond taking a drug and learning what other things we can do to neutralise the side effects, we actually will be able to uh, take uh, pre, pre-drugs, if you will, or pre-disease um, interventions. Um, so I think that's in the not-too-distant future as well. But it's going to need some work because... Um, but AI will get us there um, purely because that's really that we need that level of bandwidth in terms of mm. um, discovery to um, to get to that point. It's an enormous challenge. I mean, it's sort of the the holy grail that I, I hear from a lot of people with genetics and your blood biomarkers and put all these t- things together and therefore to optimize you, you need X. But that's just a massive computational problem problem at the moment yeah but but so worth solving right because if we can uh in our 30s start to hit off these conditions that we inevitably encounter as we age if we can start to do regular health checks and get ahead of that then um you know maybe we don't need to be um dealing with some of the diseases that we're, we 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 deal with right now um, when we accept them as inevitable but i think the uh, future generations will be uh, proactively dealing with this, and and the, the you know it'll, I think it's actually going to be bigger than the pharmaceutical industry. Well, in fact, the pharmaceutical industry will will adopt this um, once we understand how to do it. Um, simply because um, you know it's probably better to you know, have forty years worth of product that's stopping people getting unwell versus five years of product uh, staving off uh, the inevitable decline that we enjoy as we get older. One of the gripes that I have with I have a lot of doctors in my life and my personal physician tends to be quite conservative and he's sort of of the disease model. For instance, I went in like last year and I I had a calcium CT scan 
And so I'm, I'm going to be 65 next week. And it was like, I think it was like a two or a three or something. And he's like, oh, this is very good. And I said, no, it's not. Zero is very good. Three is not good because I can't take three back to zero, right? It's just compounding. So let's look at this. And he's a good doctor, but I think that so much of where we're at now is uh, symptom treatment, but it makes sense because symptoms is all we see. So if, if that's what we see, that's what we treat. But if we can sort of pre-see what, where the trajectory of things, I mean, that makes a lot more sense to me. Yeah, like, I mean, we've, we're dealing with, and it's no fault of anybody because it's just where we're at in terms of our evolution in, in medical care, but we're in sick care right now in terms of dealing with problems as they arise. So really we want a preventative maintenance model where we're going in and understanding things. And if we look at how diseases develop, it's not, uh, it, it's not, it just doesn't happen overnight, right? We have something goes wrong, we get some oxidative stress that persists, which turns into, into inflammation. Inflammation persists, and then all of a sudden we get disease. So let's you know, let's walk it back um, to you know, first principles. As Mr. Elon Musk looks at, at things and say, right, how do we get ahead of it? How do we identify these issues as they're starting to emerge? And then we we we, you know, we stamp stamp it out. We we deal with it, and it's it's lifestyle because uh, you know eighty percent of uh, conditions we deal with um, are actually to do with what's happening in our world um, that start to cause the disease. So look, let's let's look at how we, we live healthy. And uh, one of my uh, pet issues is just, you know, we'll, you know, and we'll, you know, in 200 years, they're gonna look, be looking back at us as being in the dark ages because we, we don't live lives which optimize our biology. It's crazy. We don't exercise as much as we should. We don't eat like we should. Our Western diet's not fantastic. Um, there's too much sugar in our lives. Um, these are things which will be, I don't know if it's outlawed, but certainly will be educated to understand their impact. And uh, and I think even just minimizing sugar is going to have, a, it's almost going to be as big as stamping out tobacco. So th these are really basic things we know, um, but we just need to do. My favorite sort of bugbear with sugar is there's a beverage here called Mountain Dew. 16 <laughs> ounces of Mountain Dew is going to hit you with maybe 50 grams of fructose. To me, this should be a controlled substance. You should need a, like, if for some reason you have to have this, you need a prescription. Like, I, yeah. that, that people are allowed to, that this is out there and it's advertised. I just, this is insanity. It is insanity, especially when you think about what the, what the cost of that is ultimately um, in terms of shortening lives, in terms of morbidity of, it's uh, yeah. it's just ridiculous. So you, you know, I couldn't agree more. These things need to be removed from this this planet, and uh, and the quicker that it's done, the better. Um, you know, unfortunately, sugar is cheap and it's uh, tasty and it's nice, and we all love it um, generally. Uh, and so there's just a huge industry around it, but uh, it's not it's not serving us well. And and now we understand that, um, just like we went through the, the, I guess, taxing tobacco. Maybe we've got to do the same just to uh, to just nudge the population away um, from it and educate people how bad it is for us. I read a thing the other day that people who've been diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, is there some, it's crazy statistic, it was like 10 or 15% of them actually modify their behavior in some way. Just telling yeah. somebody they're going to die or have a leg amputate or something doesn't seem to be enough. Yeah, it's, it's incredible. Human behavior is is such a, an interesting uh, study. And really where we need to start is ed education right at, right at the start, empower kids and go into schools and talk about how we can optimize our biology. I mean, we're ancient humans in a modern world. We've got, uh, for whatever reason, uh, a, 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 a I guess a food complex which is uh, not serving us and uh, really you know I guess by the time we get to our 20s or through our teenage those those behaviors are, are kind of embedded and it's really difficult to, to unwind them so we need to start early and, and, and get educating. I want to go back because I find this whole like AI discovery and targeting of novel molecules fascinating it just seems like it's such a different path of discovery that hasn't been done in the past. I mean, are you seeing 
since my guess is you've already started to work with these folks, are you already seeing things that are surprising to you? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think if, if you know, for most people, it's like you know, ChatGPT GP, is a is a game changer. You can type in a, a question and get a, an answer straight back, which is uh, almost like you know, having a chat with a you know a, a learned professional that understands the entire world, if you will. So, the breakthroughs that we're seeing and understanding. Um, and the insights that we're getting that just wouldn't have made the connection um, mm. without this, uh, this this super brain um, is 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 humbling really. So you know we are going to see rapid um, advances in our understanding of uh, how we interact with the pathways associated with aging. And I think what's really interesting is this is stage one, right? What we're doing is around nutraceutical discovery. Uh, I would say that the work that's being done, what we're doing, is is very easy way pathways towards pharmaceutical discovery as well. Because uh, through this work, we'll understand where the targets are. Um, natural ingredients are uh, are fantastic, uh, but we can improve on them. And uh, and so as we understand these targets, as we understand more about what's happening, then uh, I think uh, from in silico medicine's perspective. Here's an opportunity to um, to to look at okay how do we improve on nature and and actually mm. uh, start to solve aging and uh, their stated purpose is, is they are an anti aging company that's that's um, that's using AI and so I'm I'm, I'm you know, really excited for that particular company in terms of what they're doing and excited to be on the journey with them so that we can develop products that are um, just just uh, yeah, uh, have a a high chance of having a, a, a very interesting effect on the aging process. And did I understand products coming to market next summer? Yeah, that's right. So we're, uh, we're, we're like, it's incredible the speed that these, uh, these guys operate at. And so uh, we'll have uh, um, candidates and molecules and ingredients and testing before, before Christmas. So um, yeah, it's, uh, wow. you know, when I first engaged with them, I, uh, uh, my timeline was somewhat expanded. They said, oh, no, we'll, we'll get back to you in a fortnight with what we think is is good because really <laughs> once you put queries in, right, it's uh, it, it can happen in a, a flash. And it's really a matter of the right questions uh, gives you great answers. Wow. <laughs> I, somebody, I was uh, invited to speak at a, um, one of the luxury car manufacturers from Europe invited me to come and speak to some of their design people about the future. And one of the things that came up is we're all Luddites now. Like that's. <laughs> yeah. We, it's, it, we're so fortunate to be alive at the, uh, at this time where uh, we're experiencing the birth of AI and it's going to turn into uh, AGI, which is going to just be the most incredible time. So we're, um, it's going to be challenging, of course, because uh, we don't know what the impact on society will be. But uh, I'm an optimist. I think that uh, it's going to essentially augment what it means to be human, not just in terms of how we work, but how our health is, um, what opportunities we have. Uh, it's incredible. So we've got to kind of strap uh, strap in and see where it's going to take us. Um, but uh, there, are, yeah, what I'm seeing is uh, it's, it's you know we're going to be getting into an age of abundance. We're going to solve uh, you know energy. We're going to that's going to just liberate um, uh, all sorts of opportunities for us. So you know watch the space. I've had Dr. Mike Roizen on this podcast a couple of times. Uh, Mike's the head of wellness at the Cleveland Clinic, and what he's told me and others is that you want to keep your organ systems in good shape. He says five to 10 years because there's all this amazing things that, are, and this was sort of pre, I haven't spoken to Mike in about a year since the whole, since AI entered all this development. So he probably has a faster timeline, but he says it's critically important that you keep yourself in reasonably good self in health and your organ systems working well so that you can take advantage of all of these things. Yeah, hundred uh, percent. Aubrey de Grey, who's a, uh, I guess, a, a futurist when it comes to longevity, believes that uh, perhaps the first person who, who's going to live to one hundred and fifty is, is walking on the planet now, 
and that the difference between living to 150 and 1500 years is possibly only 10 years. So it's so worthwhile um, uh, putting in the effort right now to be as healthy as possible, um, doing all those lifestyle uh, things that we talked about in terms of exercise and diet and sleep and stress management and being social. If we can do those uh, and take various supplements that are, are, are here now, that uh, we've got a really good chance of, of being in pretty good shape um, f to enjoy the uh, the benefits of, of what's what's ahead and and there are tens of billions of dollars of research going into this right now because what the the boffins have worked out um, and it's again you've got to look backwards to look forward but the amount of gdp on the planet that has grown over the last 200 years exponentially um, that's going to carry on and so uh, you know we are going to uh, uh, the, the 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 I believe the return on investment for um, just one extra year of of good health or good e health span extension is in the trillions of dollars. I think mm -hmm. tens of trillions, right? So um, the, the 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 it's worthwhile pursuing this because it's going to uh, unleash a massive societal dividend, and uh, and that's really where and why so many. Uh, researchers and experts are focusing on slowing the aging process. We've had Dr. Andrew Scott on this podcast, a professor of economics at Oxford. And what he told me was for every year of working life that's extended and in the U S alone, it's an increase of in GDP of four to 5%, which is in the trillions of dollars. Yeah. And that's one year. Yeah, <laughs> so that's right. It's quite yeah. something. And, and, yeah. Yeah, and we're actually going to need to solve this problem now because we are dealing to, with uh, issues of uh, population de uh, um, decline. Uh, we're dealing with issues of healthcare costs where we, it's just not sustainable to keep going the way we're going. So we've we've really got to deal with that. And uh, being a young human is, is, is going to be relatively scarce going forward. So, you know, these are uh, actually... Um, Making sure that we're all productive and uh, healthy um, into our hundreds, or, you know, be and beyond, um, from an economic perspective, is actually incredibly important, and um, and it's pr probably it's a, an issue that we're going to solve just in time, because uh, yeah, and yeah, we 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 need to solve it and and, and somewhat urgently. I think uh, what is it? Two billion of us are going to be over the age of sixty, uh, in in a, about a, a little over two decades. Or 25 years so um uh these this is a big issue that's coming at us it's a i guess a slow emergency but um if around 50 percent of people over the age of 60 are dealing with uh, chronic health concerns um you know i think 17 percent of gdp in the, the states is, goes to healthcare right now um more i believe yeah yeah more so uh if we kind of push that forward it could be 30 percent. that's we can't afford it so this, this shift is, is, is really important. Absolutely. Greg, is there anything you want to leave the audience with today? Um, just, I think, really repeating uh, what you've just talked about in terms of uh, really focusing on your health um, for the next five, 10 years, because um, kicking that can along the road, staying well and staying in good shape as possible is going to potentially deliver you with decades more life. So uh, focus on that. Um, and uh, make the changes, build movement into your life, build decisions around diet, um, learn about uh, the benefits of fasting, because that uh, appears to be a really significant way that we can extend health span. Edit sugar out of your life. Just, and, and that doesn't mean just plain sugar. It also means um, some of the uh, things like bread and carbohydrates, which the body shifts into sugars as soon as you um, eat them. So. Um, do that and uh, learn about supplements which are changing and having a rejuvenative effect on cells. That's uh, it's, uh, a simple chat GPT uh, search or a Google search will tell you uh, what molecules those are. Um, and um, and just yeah, stay curious and stay uh, aware of what's happening out there because um, whilst uh, perhaps 10 years ago supplements were considered just uh, perhaps something that is nice to take, uh, now we're learning that they're a, a should take. Greg is the CEO of SRW, um, and you can find SRW at srw.co. Great to have you on, as always. 
Love our conversations. I know you're doing some trials here in Utah, and hopefully we'll get you back here and um, have another adventure up in the snowy mountains. That'd be amazing. Thanks, David. Appreciate uh, the opportunity to talk. Great to see you today.